President Biden just announced an aggressive plan to cut greenhouse gas emissions in half by 2030. Will it bring a long overdue economic transformation or threaten the country's growth on the brink of a recovery? No doubt Lynn Good will help shape what happens next. She's the chair, president, and CEO of Duke Energy, one of the largest U.S. utility companies, which has vowed to reach net zero emissions by 2050. She spent the first half of her career at accounting giant Arthur Anderson before jumping over to the energy sector in the early 2000s and taking over Duke Energy about a decade later. Today, the company has a market cap of more than $76 billion and serves millions of customers. On this episode of Influencers, I speak with Lynn about the challenges of the climate transition, the ambitious Biden agenda, and what it all means for the energy sector's bottom line. Hello, everyone. I'm Andy Serwer. Welcome to Influencers and welcome to our guest, Lynn Good, CEO of Duke Energy. Lynn, nice to see you. Andy, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So climate change is a very big topic right now. It's a big topic in Washington, D.C., of course. And President Biden recently announced a pledge to cut greenhouse gas emissions by at least 50 percent by 2030. Does that goal make sense for America? Andy, it's a great topic, and it's certainly a current one. Uh, I have been spending a lot of time on climate for a long time, and certainly the pace in 2021 has picked up. You know, Duke Energy is a believer in reducing carbon emissions, and we have been at the work of reducing emissions really for about a decade. So our carbon emissions are down 40% from 2005 as I sit here today. And our goal is to be at least 50% by 2030. I think as the president talks about his goals, he's talking about an economy-wide goal. So also taking in transportation, also in industry and, and business use of, uh, of carbon. And so I do think it is, there's a shared goal, a common goal to reduce carbon emissions. And this really sets the table for the conversations we need to have about the technologies that we need in order to make the progress to net zero. And we're anxious to be a part of those conversations. Do you think those kinds of national goals, uh, Lynn, are achievable? And, and what do goals like that mean uh, for the bottom line of your company and the energy sector as a whole? A couple of things I would point to, Andy. We have really uh, looked at our goal in terms of what we can do with present technologies. So I'm thinking about retiring pull, bringing in renewable solar, wind, battery, some natural gas for reliability and resiliency. And we have a clear line of sight to get to at least 50% by 2030. To get to an ultimate net zero, we have set a target of 2050 to get to net zero because we see a need for technology to develop. It could be hydrogen. It could be advanced nuclear with storage, carbon capture, other technologies that have the ability to meet the demands of our customers when they need the electricity. Uh, and that uh, investment in R&D we think is really critical in the next decade so that we be can begin to use those technologies in the 2030s and 2040s to get to net zero. So it's, there's no simple solution today on the shelf uh, to achieve these uh, very important goals. But I think as a country and with the right focus and the right resources and the right attention on the tools that we need, we can make substantial progress. And that's our commitment at Duke Energy. I mean, is there a risk that aggressive climate goals could harm economic growth or that jobs lost in industries like coal would be difficult to replace? I think about environmental progress on carbon reduction, Andy, going hand in hand with two things, reliability, so we have to be able to transition this big electric sector in a way that maintains reliability. Our industrial customers count on it. Our residential customers count on it. And we also have to keep an eye on affordability um, because economic competitiveness, um, electricity is a part of the input in our country to be economically competitive. So the pace of change and price typically go hand in hand. And as I think about this need for research and development, 
it is really to get these technologies to commercial scale at a price that's affordable so we can take advantage of them to make environmental progress. So it's really all three things. Let's work on the environmental reduction of carbon, but let's maintain reliability and affordability because it's that combination that really makes us competitive as a country. Uh, and that's our goal as we think about the targets we've set, we always set them with reliability and affordability in mind. You mentioned reliability and of course my mind goes right to Texas and what happened there. And well, maybe I'll just ask you, Lynn, what happened there and could that happen to Duke? There are a number of things uh, that come to my mind, Andy. Uh, certainly very low temperatures and very low temperatures coupled with um, lack of thorough weatherization for that type of decline in temperature. Some import issues where power can't get into the state easily, some market issues. There were a number of things. So from renewables to natural gas uh, to all kinds of plants, there were issues that developed as a part of that. And so we are taking this as an opportunity to relook at our weather weatherization, relook at our import capacity, relook at our diversity of fuels, relook at dual fuel capability. So we're not dependent on just one fuel at a site. And I think it's an opportunity for the industry to learn. There are some differences at Duke. We operate in a regulated market. We have very um, well understood capacity requirements. We survive the polar vortex and have specific weatherization that has to occur. And because we're in the hurricane zone, we have an opportunity to look at our grid and grid investment over and over to make sure we're investing there. And then dual fuel and diverse fuel capabilities are something that we've had for a long time. So I think what Texas has done is really elevate the conversation about the importance of reliability. Because when you go through any form of transformation of this energy sector, you can't walk away from it. Our customers are counting on it. And so we'll take this opportunity to learn and refresh. If there's anything that uh, we can do differently and better to make sure our customers have power, we will certainly do that. Yeah, it's interesting because I did pick up on the fact that you were accentuating reliability and maybe that does come to the fore when you see something like that happening in another state like that. Um, let me ask you, you know, there's so much conversation now about climate change and reducing your carbon footprint. Do you get a little frustrated sometimes that people sort of overlook the fact, oh, well, we're turning on the lights every day and it just does that. But you better reduce your carbon footprint. I mean, do people sort of overlook that, it seems to you? It's an interesting question, Andy, because I do think our industry, like a lot of industries, um, has been back of mind for a long time. You can, you can go a lifetime without seeing how power is actually produced because you know they're in areas outside of our urban center, et cetera. And we want you to count on us when you flip a switch without worrying about whether reliability is there. So I do think there's been some uh, call to educate on the complexity of what we do. And as I talk with policymakers, and I certainly talk with our regulators, I talk with the agencies at the federal level, they understand the complexity of the bulk power system, how generation and transmission and distribution all have to work together. They appreciate there's no single solution that uh, the strength of our industry has really been built on diverse resources over a long period of time. But I do think there's a need to educate and talk about how to bring reliability and complex systems together with environmental goals. And that's certainly our commitment here at Duke. What is the future mix of energy, sources of energy look like um, in terms of electricity uh, down the road? You mentioned we, we have coal and natural gas, um, there's renewables, you mentioned next-gen nuclear. What's your best guess, Lynn? Sure. I think I'd go to renewables first, Andy. I look at the renewables that we operate today. We will double renewable capacity by 2025. We will triple it by 2030, and it'll be 40% plus of our energy mix by 2050. So renewables, associated battery storage that might be complementary to that, I think just increases, increases, increases. For us, I would put nuclear right at the top of the list as well. So Duke is the largest operator of regulated nuclear plants in the US. It represents 50% of the power that we deliver in the Carolinas. Maintaining those carbon-free nuclear resources is very important 
to achieving these environmental goals because I don't have a resource to replace nuclear with uh, that's carbon free and, and provides the stable all the time energy that it supplies. I do believe natural gas is going to be a part of the equation for a while, Andy, because it, it has a different operating profile than either a renewable or a nuclear plant. It has the ability to uh, back up or support renewables when, there aren't, when they aren't available. So think about um, you know, a, a winter morning when customers are using power, solar is not on the system, nuclear plants already running, what am I going to do to meet the need for that load? That's where natural gas plays a role today. And I think it will continue to play a role. Uh, battery technology, I would put in the mix. And then this need for R&D. When I start to pull fossil fuels out of the mix in the 2030s, I have a deficit of resources, meaning I need something that doesn't exist today. That's where advanced nuclear with storage or hydrogen or carbon capture, longer duration storage, all of those things could come into the mix. And I believe we will see them and need to see them in the, in the 2030s to get to our net zero goal. Yeah, I wanna drill down a little bit in a couple of those areas. Let's talk about renewables. You're talking mostly about solar when you're talking about renewables, right? It depends on the geography, Andy. So in the Carolinas, solar is the predominant renewable resource. I think offshore wind could become important end of this decade into the 2030s. If you move into the middle part of the country, it'll be probably more wind. You move north, maybe more wind. And so the geography, I think, matters. Solar also in Florida is an important resource. Uh, I think it's, um, it's important to recognize that there are geographies where a renewable resource works better than others. And in an economic way, if we can match that geography with the resource, I think it'll be more competitive for our customers. And the big problem with solar really is the storage problem. That I, what was the line that you, it's the only business where you make stuff and then you can't save it or something like that, right? <laughs> there you go. There, there are batteries today, Andy, but they represent hours. So if you generate the power in the afternoon, you can move that to the evening. But as I look at pulling out natural gas and other resources, I may need to move the power from one week to three weeks down the road, or I may need to move it from October to January. And that's where things like hydrogen could, could potentially come into the mix. That's where natural gas with carbon capture, that's where advanced nuclear with a storage capability uh, could be useful. So that you have the ability to generate the carbon-free electricity and then use it when your customer needs the electricity. I want to ask now about nuclear a little bit because, you know, of course, people, they get their hackles up and think Fukushima, Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and then the huge cost overruns. Why are you sanguine about this, Lynn, and what does next-gen nuclear really mean? Andy, it's a very good question, and we have been a long-term operator of nuclear at Duke Energy, a leader, really, in this technology, and our commitment to our customers and communities is we will operate it safely, no, no full stop. We will only operate these plants as long as we have the highest degree of confidence that they can operate safely. And they represent such a foundational element of what we supply today, and it's really throughout the US, um, a substantial amount of the carbon-free energy that we use across the US comes from nuclear. So maintaining that, while we bring in other technologies to continue our progress is really important. I know safety can be a question and we engage actively with our communities uh, so that they understand what the safety um, requirements are that we demand of our resources. And I think that will continue to be important. And our communities generally embrace these plants. They're big employers, they're active in the community in a way that not only supplies great power, but also supports those communities. I think the issue you're raising on price is really an issue that um, you could raise on any new and developing technology. So when I think about advanced nuclear, um, next generation nuclear, these are technologies that are under development today. Bill Gates is very active in this with TerraPower. Uh, it's an advanced reactor that has the ability to store power in molten salt to be used as needed. Um, a demonstration project is planned in the early 2030s, so we need to get it developed, we need to get it commercial, we need to get it down the price curve uh, so that that technology becomes more viable. Um, you know, offshore wind, also expensive today. 
If we invest in it, we get the infrastructure to support it, we get the permitting working in a way that is achievable, its price will also come down. And so I do think there's an introduction of some of these advanced technologies that you invest to get them there and then you get the price curve down so that it's more affordable. Uh, and the advanced nuclear that we're looking at, Andy, comes in smaller pieces. So 200 megawatts, not 2000. Uh, and so you have a chance to bring in a smaller resource at hopefully a smaller price uh, as we continue our progress on carbon reduction. Fascinating. It's interesting that in all these areas, you're sort of counting on, I guess it's accurate to say, technological breakthroughs to enhance the P&L on these businesses, right? Really to enhance the solutions that we can put yeah. in place to deliver the power that our customers are counting on. Right. Um, and that's really the way I would talk about it, Andy. Yeah. Um, and it needs to be affordable uh, in order for us to maintain yeah. the economic competitiveness of our regions. You mentioned offshore wind. Does that have the same storage issues at this point that solar has? The capacity of offshore wind, meaning the amount of time that it generates energy is generally uh, more than solar. So if you think about the capacity of a solar plant, generally around 20%. Offshore wind can be 40 to 50% and even higher in certain geographic regions. And so it does have the ability to produce more often Andy, but it's not 95%, which is what we enjoy with a nuclear power plant. Uh, and so there still will be the need to transmit the power. Um, you know, I think about offshore wind here in the Carolinas in particular. People don't live on the coast in the Carolinas. The big load, they do, but the big load centers are in Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro, Charlotte. And so getting the power to the people will, will require a transmission investment. And of course, battery storage and other forms of storage could be part of the solution as well. And how can those big things withstand hurricanes? Well, they're, they are rated to withstand weather conditions. Um, and that's certainly something you'd look at closely in the Atlantic coast because of the hurricane patterns that we experience. Yeah, no doubt. I think I read, Lynn, that you knew exactly what day, not surprised, that you knew exactly what day was the peak power usage in the Charlotte area day in February, I think you said. Yes. And um, that sort of surprised me because I thought it would be air conditioning, but I guess it's heating, right? It's heating. Talk about how it is with different geographies that you serve that way. Sure. And you know, it's interesting, Andy, because the peak load in the Carolinas has moved back and forth between summer and winter oh. over, you know, a, a, a number of years, but it's been more often in the winter recently. And what's significant about that is we need to be able to meet peak demand. That's what we represent is assets available when our customers need the power. And the unique aspects of the winter are the peak usually occurs when it's dark in the morning, which makes it difficult to have a renewable resource available. And further, a lot of times in the winter, we'll have an overcast week, meaning that the resource may not be available to full power, a renewable resource, solar, to full power at any point over a week. So that gives us a need to have some of these diverse resources that are I can call upon when my customer needs the power. Uh, certainly, we experience uh, air conditioning load in the Southeast. Um, that's an important part of what we do as well. Solar matches a little bit better with summer peak because the power gets produced in the afternoon. I can move it to the evening if need be. Uh, so it's a resource that may match, you know, matches a little bit better with summer peak. Well, that's fascinating though that it flip-flops in North Carolina, whereas in Florida, it's always the summer and in Maine, it's always the winter, right? That's right, that's right. Interesting. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit and ask about uh, President Biden's infrastructure proposal, the $2 trillion infrastructure proposal. Um, what do you think about that and how does an energy company like Duke fit in to the thinking there? You know, Bill, it's very related to what we've just been talking about, because when I think about all of the work we're doing around climate, what it really means to Duke Energy is a massive change in infrastructure. It is retirement of existing assets and it's bringing in new assets. And it's um, you know, investing in the grid for reliability and the ability to incorporate all these renewables. It's making EV infrastructure available for customers as electrification becomes a part of the equation. So I think of infrastructure as something as a private capital company we are anxious to invest in. Certainly public policy 
can support that. And I think, uh, as I understand some of the things that are being discussed on this infrastructure bill, incentives for renewable energy, uh, investment in research and development, permitting reform potentially to make infrastructure a little easier to accomplish in a timely way. So we are engaged in the conversation looking for whether or not there's any alignment around what the president is trying to achieve and what we're trying to achieve with the infrastructure bill to achieve our climate goals. Another development in the Biden administration is uh, tax reform, corporate tax reform. And, you know, you were an accountant, right? Um, yes. Still are, I guess. <laughs> so I Maybe ask... by degree. I'm not right. I don't hold any certificates anymore, Andy. <laughs> right, right. There you go. Um, I want to ask you about uh, the tax burden that you pay. Uh, and, you know, is it enough? Should you pay more? Uh, what do you think about tax reform when it comes to your company? I think there are a couple of things I would talk about, Andy, and as tax reform is being discussed, one of the things that is being discussed is tax incentives around this clean energy transition. So tax incentives for electrification, electric vehicles, EV infrastructure, perhaps battery storage, perhaps extension of tax incentives for wind and solar. So I think all of those things are complementary to the clean energy transition that we're talking about. But one of the things that's unique about a regulated company um, like Duke Energy is income taxes are part of the cost of delivering electricity. And so what I mean by that is when tax rates came down, I reduced the cost of electricity to my customers by over a billion dollars. It did not stay in the corporate coffers at Duke Energy. It flowed right to customers. And similarly, if taxes rise, um, it becomes something that we'll work with our regulators and customers on uh, to try to minimize the impact. So it is just part of what a regulated company does. Uh, and so we're focused, of course, on this within that construct of affordability and also uh, the incentives to help align with the clean energy transition. Lynn, talk about uh, the past 12 months and COVID and how that impacted the business and then also other constituents, which is to say employees, and where do you sure. think things are right now? Sure. Andy, it was a, a moment, I guess, about a year ago, right, in March, where we were trying to decide how do we, uh, how do we work in an, in an environment called a pandemic. And for Duke, if you think about our employees in power plants, our line workers that um, are so important for storm restoration and maintaining reliable power, about 50%, 40 to 50% of our workforce has been in the workplace, in the field, absolutely every day. And maintaining safety, temperature checking, masking, social distancing, changing our processes so people aren't gathering, changing the way we do hurricane restoration because we can't house and feed people the same way. All of that has been a keen focus because keeping our employees safe is job one, uh, job one at Duke Energy. Um, the other part of the employee base, we enabled to work remotely much like you're doing. Uh, putting technology and other resources in place so our employees could work safely that way. And then in terms of the business, we suffered a decline in electric usage, really driven by our industrial customers as they were figuring out how are we going to deal with the pandemic. And then our commercial customers, colleges and universities, retail, restaurants, you know, think about all the challenges small businesses has ha have had. So we had a decline in electric load as a result of that. What sort of a decline was it? Was it 10%, 30%? So, How do you characterize No, you know, by, by class, it could have been 10 to 15 early on in the industrial segment. For the whole year, though, Andy, it was about 3% uh, right. all of 2020. Did you see an increase in consumer because people were at home doing- We saw an increase day? in residential. Exactly the case. And so as we sit here today, we are optimistic about the rebound, uh, but we still believe it's going to take us until 2022 to get back to 2019 levels hmm, okay. in terms of electric sales. We were also really active with customers because this wasn't just a pandemic, it was an economic issue. So we suspended disconnects, we waived late payment fees. We did all kinds of things to try to support customers during this time. And that has been uh, an important part of our work through this entire period. And we're pleased to see a number of our small businesses reopening and customers getting back on their feet uh, so it was not only a health issue, it was an economic issue. And how many employees do you have? And are the office workers back in the offices right now, Lynn? 
Not quite. So we employ almost 30,000 employees and uh, Andy have probably another 30,000 um, contract resources on our system helping uh, with, our, um, with our work. Right now, uh, we're going to pilot bringing back a few thousand employees in June, and then we'll begin returning um, the rest of the workforce in September. We're offering a hybrid approach, sometime at home, sometime in the office, uh, as we you know, uh, bring people back to the workplace, not only to provide flexibility, but so that we can continue to um, you know, experience social distancing and other things that might be important, depending on how uh, the vaccination and the virus behaves over the rest of the year. Lynn, let me ask you a little bit about Duke's stock. Um, the stock has underperformed the averages over the past year or so, um, but kind of made up some of that over the past couple of months. Is this the classic growth versus value trade-off in the market that we've also been, we've been covering so much? And how are you addressing this? How are you thinking about Duke's stock right now? Sure, we've had a really strong 2021 and, and Andy, the, the rebound in the stock really started in about July of last year. And it had to do with a couple of things, resolving some uncertainties around the company, regulatory uncertainties, some litigation and other things, but also uh, building some momentum around growth. Uh, this clean energy transition, we had an ESG day, we filed some plans in our largest jurisdiction on how we're going to achieve these reductions, what it means for investors, raised our growth rate. And so the combination of a really strong vision for the future with growth and a strong dividend, I think has positioned the stock really well. And that coupled with eliminating uncertainties, as you know, uh, investors always prefer when uncertainties are um, eliminated, and to the extent we can do that, I think that has also been a real benefit to the stock. So we're optimistic, and as we think about the economy rebounding, we're really well positioned with uh, the Carolinas and Florida leading the way with um, customer growth, migration, other things that I think really underpin the growth of the company going forward. Last year, Lynn Forbes named Duke one of the best employers for women. Um, what have you done to succeed in that area? And why do you think it's been so difficult for the business world as a whole to make progress, especially at the leadership level? And I guess, is it easier to make progress being a woman CEO? I, I don't know, Andy, if it is easier because um, you know I'm a woman. What I would say is the progress around diversity and inclusion is extraordinarily important to Duke Energy. And I would also say the work is never done. And so 2020 was just a reminder to all of us of the importance of diversity and inclusion, progressing employees, progressing minorities into leadership roles. And we really used 2020 as an opportunity to reignite our aspirations around uh, diversity and inclusion to make sure our culture is the kind of culture that embraces um, employees from very diverse backgrounds. We hosted over 500 conversations uh, among employees on what diversity and inclusion means, really on the, uh, you know, resulting from the George Floyd incident um, earlier in the year. So I would say the progress is never done, um, but I would also say that at Duke, we place a very high priority on making sure that we are creating a diverse workplace that is inclusive uh, so that our company looks like the communities that we serve. You credit your father, who was a teacher, for steering you in a career into business. Um, what did you learn from him, and how does that affect how you um, do business today? I would say, Andy, that my father um, had a big impact on me, and I'm sure fathers uh, have an opportunity to impact young women all the time. Uh, it was nothing more complicated than telling me I could do anything. And when you get that endorsement as a young person, you know, looking at college careers and uh, imagining what you can do, uh, that endorsement was really important to me. So I came from a family of teachers. Uh, it's an honorable profession. Um, and uh, there are a lot of teachers and nurses in my, in my family. And my father actually talked with me about, Lynn, I think computer science might be good for you because you're, you're mathematical and financial and so on. And so he kind of pushed me to move in a slightly different direction and uh, did so in a very encouraging way. So he was a, um, he passed away a few years ago and he was a, 
a Marine by background, had an extraordinary impact on my life. And I'm, you know, very proud of my father. That's great. Um, my parents were both teachers. My father passed away a few years ago and was in the army. So there you go. I know, I know the feeling. Um, final question, Lynn, what do you see your legacy being at this point? Now, I hope my legacy, Andy, is that Duke Energy is a stronger co company, uh, achieving all that we're capable of achieving, not only this clean energy transit transition we've been talking about, but delighting our customers, serving them well, being the diverse and inclusive employer and community leader that I know we're capable of. So I would say a strong Duke Energy will be an incredible legacy for me. Um, and uh, I'm honored to be in this role and be surrounded by so many great people who care deeply about what we do. Lynn Good, CEO of Duke Energy, thank you so much for your time. Andy, thank you, it's a pleasure. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, we'll see you next time.